Hey everyone, thanks for joining us. Um, we only have about 45, 50 minutes, so we're gonna jump right in. I would like to introduce you to our patient. Uh, her name is Nicole. She is a 27-year-old female at the time that she first comes to visit me, and she was referred to me by a dental student, actually. Um, she was asking around. Um, she has seen several dentists for consultations. Um, she's actually traveled all over to different dentists, and she has some very specific concerns and some very specific desires. Most of all, she doesn't want to do much dentistry at all. She wants to complete her entire case um, as minimally invasive as possible. And let me show you um, her right and left side, and certain things may jump out at you right away. Right smile, left smile, retracted view, and you'll notice that her right side is significantly different than her left side. Um, she has a retained primary canine on her right side and um, a peg lateral on her right side also. And that is really where um, her chief concern is and where our treatment planning um, is going to get a little tricky. So she wants to make that right side match her left side. Um, she has a very small root on the retained primary canine. And if you look at the mesiodistal width on her upper left compared to her upper right, you can see that we have some tooth uh, position uh, issues that we're going to have to deal with. Um, she has had the permanent canine extracted and so she had previous orthodontics um, from the age of about 12 to 14 and you'll if you notice a few screens back she also has some scarring on her facial gingiva where they went in to remove through the facial um, to remove her permanent canine on that right side uh, she's had endo on the peg lateral it never um, became symptomatic. She had a periapical lesion that was found on a routine exam some years back, and she's had the endo done. And then you can kind of get an idea um, for the size of this primary canine root on her right side. So if we start to evaluate Nicole and we look at her midline, because if we're trying to get space to mimic her left side on her right side, we want to know how far we can shift this midline in her face. And if we correct these images and draw an interpupillary line and start looking, um, you'll find out that her midline is about a millimeter and a half off to her right side. And if we start talking about our diagnosis and what's going on here, um, you'll notice that she's also missing a mandibular left central incisor. Um, that tooth is, was never extracted um, like the canine was on her upper right. She was congenitally missing it. And she is uh, class 2 Div 1. And um, the ortho was done for about two years out of state when she lived in Colorado previously. And she has that narrow mesiodistal width of that maxillary uh, lateral incisor on her right side. And then our canine is missing, so we don't have the option of uh, possibly bringing it in. <clears throat> and then her arch is constricted in the maxilla, and then it's narrow in the mandible. And so one of the first things that I want to know with Nicole is um, if she's willing to do ortho. And I actually asked her, I said, are you willing to go into orthodontics again? And she said, well, is that my best option? And I said, I really think it is. And so I referred her for a consult um, to meet my orthodontist. And we evaluated her airway and took a CBCT to really start um, seeing, you know, is she a candidate for an implant? We don't want to move teeth, create space for an implant, get to a position where um, we realize, you know, we're never going to get the mesiodistal space that we need, or maybe she doesn't have the bone that we need for the implant following the extraction of her canine. And so we want, really want to evaluate her before we get there to make sure that we can um, get things to the position that we want. 
Now also remember, not only do we need to create space for the canine implant, but we need to create space so that we can make her right lateral incisor the same mesiodistal dimension as her left lateral incisor. So we need room for the lateral and we need room for the canine. Now what you'll notice, and this kind of was a universal theme as we went through the process with Nicole, is around every corner we ran into things. And so when you look at the curvature, that mesial angular curvature of her first spike cuspid, you can almost see that it's saying um, no implant here. It's, it's, it's turning back into the area right where we need to place an implant. So if we zoom into that area and we start taking um, some measurements on the comb beam, you'll notice that she's just shy of four millimeters in space up at the roots. And so we are going to have to make sure that we create enough space if an implant is the way we're going to go. If you start considering if we're not going to go the route of the implant, what are we going to do with that peg lateral? Because most of us wouldn't feel comfortable having a pontic canine in a 27-year-old anyway, especially on a peg lateral previously treated with endo. So maybe we want to um, go a different route entirely. Uh, maybe we want to extract both teeth. Um, if we were all together and we could have a discussion, I'm sure that we could come up with lots of creative ways and discussions to have regarding what could possibly be a treatment option. And if we drop in an implant, um, you can see this uh, lesion right here on the facial, this abfraction lesion on that primary canine. So we're right in the canine position where we've dropped that implant in and we're just doing this digitally to kind of see so we can travel down the bone and kind of see what's going on. And if you look over on the far right of your screen, you're going to realize between the apex of the implant and the adjacent teeth, we don't have much room at all. And remember, we need to create room here for this lateral incisor also. We do have the advantage of her midline being off, you know, to her right, so we can shift that to her left and maybe even overcorrect it slightly if we have to to get some room. So here's a closer look. That's what we have to deal with where she currently is. So the question would be, is it possible to do her case without any ortho? And I think our result would be compromised. Remember, she doesn't want to have a lot of teeth treated. She wants to have as few treats teeth treated as possible and as minimally invasive as possible. Um, here's that scar that I mentioned earlier where they went in and extracted her um, permanent canine. And I, when I asked her about that, she didn't know the reason why they extracted it versus uh, maybe forced orthodontic eruption um, and bringing it in another way. So she said, I don't really know. They never really talked to me about it much. They just told me I needed to have a surgery and I had the surgery. And so um, I would say and I would ask you to think to yourself, what's our plan going to be? What are our instructions going to be to the orthodontist? We are actually going to try and complete her treatment um, in Invisalign. And I'm going to play the clin check here for you so you can get an idea of what we're going to try and accomplish. And the if you're not unfamiliar with Invisalign, the blue um, diamonds here, that's going to be our interproximal reduction. So that's where we're going to attempt to remove some tooth structure to gain space. And then these other boxes, the green boxes, that's going to be the residual space that we're going for once our tooth movement is complete. So I'm going to play that for you one more time. And you're going to notice that she also has somewhat of an unattractive midline embrasure. So at the beginning of treatment, um, she has this embrasure here that is touching right at the gingiva, but as it moves coronally, it opens, and we're going to do some IPR and try to make that more attractive and try to close that. We're also going to do some intrusion of her right central incisor to level her gingival margins, thinking that we'll come back and do uh, some sort of restorative work on there when we're done. And then let me show you this um, from the occlusal view. We're also going to expand her maxillary arch. We're going to gain the space that we need to restore the peg lateral. And we're going to gain the room that we need 
to not only place an implant in the right canine, but also when we're done with our restorations, so that if we were to measure the distance from the mesial of the first by to the distal of the right central, it would equal now on the right side as it does currently on her upper left side. And then on the right, you would have to think if we expand the maxillary arch, how is that going to affect the relationship between her mandible and her maxilla? Well, if we left her mandible the way that it is and simply leveled and aligned the teeth, we would have excess overjet when we're done. We would have too much overjet. We wouldn't get a class one canine relationship. And so we're going to have to do um, some restorative work when we're done on the mandible, but I want to show you what our plan is for the mandible. We are going to expand, and because she's missing um, that left central incisor on her lower, um, we are going to take and place her canines into a class one relationship at the completion and then create equal space, a half millimeter to the distal of the laterals and then eight tenths of a millimeter to the distal of that one central on the lower. And we're going to leave, I'm going to, I'll give you a summary in a minute, but let me show you the right and left sides. Um, so three tenths and three tenths um, reduction on that right side, leaving um, the space, the residual space that you see in green on the right side. And then on our left side, we are going to do only IPR, shifting that midline around to her left and creating as much space to do to shift it, um, you know, doing a little bit over a certain number of teeth so that we don't have to be aggressive on any one given tooth and shifting everything to her left. So here's kind of the ortho summary. And really where this whole case kind of is going to get set up is, is right here. So a lot of discussions are going back and forth uh, with myself and my orthodontist. Um, and on the right side in her maxillary arch, we're going to remove um, eight and a half tenths of a millimeter and we're going to leave uh, 2.7 millimeters of residual space so that we can get our implant in and restore that peg lateral. And then in her lower, we're going to leave uh, 1.3 and we're going to leave the same on her lower left. Um, on her left side, on, on the maxillary arch, uh, we're going to remove a little over a millimeter and a half of space, and we're going to close everything and shift in the midline. And in the mandibular arch, again, um, the same 1.3 millimeters so that everything is symmetrical on her mandibular arch. So here she is at the completion of Invisalign. And if we draw in our inner pupillary line, we correct that image, and then we draw a line right in the middle of Nicole's face, you'll notice that we've gotten our midline almost spot on. Um, you'll also notice that we've intruded that right central. And when I zoom in here, um, you're going to kind of see what we now have to work with. We still are going to have some work that we need to do on this midline. We need to correct this incisal edge position. And the other thing that she doesn't like, and I'll show you in a minute, she doesn't like this large incisal um, embrasure here on her left side, so she'd like to do something about that. And here she is on the right side. So now we've created the same space for the canine um, and also for the lateral incisor. So right versus left, and she wants to close that incisal embrasure on her left side. So my instructions to the lab technician that I'm going to have wax this up is to close that and then wax up her right side so that the canine lateral and central absolutely mirror image her left side. So close the incisal embrasure on the left and then mimic it, everything in wax um, with these incisal edge in the midline on the right central, the right lateral to match the left lateral, and then the canine um, to match the left canine. So here's our space, and here's what we were left with on her mandibular anterior arch. So if we look at her pano now, you can see that we've gotten that curved root out of the way for our implant in the canine position on her upper right. And so now we have something that we can work with. So let's take some slices through and let's evaluate and treatment plan our implant together. <clears throat> if you notice her bone, it's, it's a tricky situation. She has a curved maxilla 
here in the canine position where we don't have the ability to kind of drill as deep as we want unless we do some sort of bone augmentation. Um, and so that is something that I discussed with her. Uh, she would like to not do that unless we have to. So let's drop in an implant digitally and you know see how much real estate that we have to work with. Um, to the contrary, so this is Nicole's Ridge. This is another primary retained canine. Just to kind of compare, um, look at how deep you can drill without getting into trouble. You can easily place a 16 millimeter implant here. Um, this patient has more bone buckle lingually, has all of the real estate that we would like as far as the length of the implant, and put the implant in, go as deep as you want, um, abutment and final restoration, and it's just very routine as normal. But Nicole's not that way. Um, if we drop in, and this is an 11 and a half, you can tell that we're most likely going to perf unless we somehow expand that bone. And so if we're not going to do that and we're not going to graft and grow um, some bone at that apical portion of the implant, we're going to be stuck with probably a 10 millimeter implant and probably a 3.7. Now that's a pretty small implant for a canine, um, but it's going to be what we're going to have to, um, you know, just accept knowing that Nicole doesn't have um, a lot of muscle activity, she doesn't have a lot of bite force, um, she's a very small individual and uh, I think we'll be good to go with that. So because it is a tricky situation, I'm going to use a surgical guide. Um, I can't go too deep, I can't go too far palatal, I don't want to get uh, the screw access coming out too far facial, and um, this is the guide that I'm going to have made. Um, I'm treatment planning a 3.7 by 10 millimeter Legacy 2, and um, I'm going to send in some models, and this is the surgical guide. It's going to have a couple of windows so that I can see um, and make sure that it is seated properly, and I'm going to do it in an immediate, so to speak. So I'm going to bring Nicole in. Um, she's completed her ortho. I'm going to extract the primary canine and seat our surgical guide. Um, that kind of showed, remember she also had recession on that tooth, so she only had um, a millimeter or two in, in bone, um, and so it was definitely a situation that we couldn't restore the primary canine and it wasn't gonna be with her. It had um, some pretty good mobility also, especially following ortho. Uh, here's our surgical guide in place. And here's our implant um, after we've uh, uh, placed, you can notice that we did an atraumatic extraction. We did not lay a flap of any kind. Um, we would graft as much as we could. So if there's any space distal or facial, which there really isn't so much because uh, that primary tooth was so small. But in most cases, I would do my routine uh, dual zone bone graft technique where I would graft the buccal gap um, not only to the platform of the implant, but all the way up to the um, facial gingival margin. And here is our parallel pin, and here is our implant in place. And now we have to make a decision. So possibly based on how much torque we were able to get on that implant um, would dictate how we handle this. And so if the implant didn't get to 35 newton centimeters, I would probably make a um, custom healing abutment. Um, her implant did torque really well, um, being that it was basically into a lot of virgin native bone. And so because it was, I'm going to make a screw retain immediate provisional. And I'm going to make that off of an impression that I took <clears throat> off of the primary canine so that I can keep her in her current Invisalign, which is her last tray, um, these cases can get tricky when you have um, a retention component and a surgical component. So remember, she just completed ortho, and we don't want any of her teeth to migrate, so she does need to be in retention, and she came in wearing some sort of appliance. In her case, it was her final Invisalign tray, and what I'm going to do is place our immediate provisional and cut her Invisalign tray down so that it still seats completely on all of her teeth, but doesn't put much pressure at all on um, our 
provisional on our canine. Then I would get our models back from the technician and you'll notice that we now have our right canine and right lateral waxed up. We also have the length corrected of our right central and then we have our incisal embrasure closed on her left canine. Here's uh, her right side and here is her left side. <clears throat> so once the implant has been in for a couple of months, probably at least three to four, I would bring Nicole back in and what I'm going to do today is I'm going to do all of her bonding on um, the maxillary arch. I'm going to, um, if I'm happy with her current tissue position, if I wasn't happy with the current tissue position, I would wait until I was on the canine. I would unscrew our provisional. I would modify the provisional in somehow shape um, to get the contour I need to gain the soft tissue profile that I need on the implant. Um, I like the, the gingival margin position currently. Uh, I do need to modify the color and I need to bond the lateral and the central and the left side also and prep her mandibular incisors uh, for porcelain veneers which is our plan. And when we finish the case um, from an orthodontic standpoint what we did is we equally spaced the mandibular incisors between the mandibular canines which are in a class one relationship with the maxillary canines and we left the case, we finished the case orthodontically with excess overjet. So that way I don't have to prep hardly any enamel off the facial surface of the mandibular incisors. But what that does is it creates a very tricky situation for us in the way that we think about veneer preparations because we don't have to reduce much facial enamel at all because we can bring the, the teeth out anteriorly um, to gain, and we have the room before we run into the lingual of the maxillary centrals, but we need to close those spaces. Because we need to close those spaces, we are going to have to design our preps so that they go subgingively significantly so that we have a nice, smooth emergence profile coming up out of the gingiva and we don't leave the technician with a situation where he or she has to stair step it out to close um, those spaces. And so I might leave the preps equigingival on the facial or make them slightly gingival on the facial, but as the prep moves um, interproximally, I'm going to drop it significantly subgingivally and I need to carry it all the way through to the lingual aspect of the teeth so that we can close those embrasures all the way through the thickness of the tooth. And so I'm going to drill down, get to our screw on the um, uh, provisional, and now I need to bond the lateral. The lateral is going to be tricky as far as the distal contour because I don't know how wide to make it. Um, I'm going to use our um, wax up and a putty matrix as a guide and that will give me the lingual aspect of it but not the exact contour. So actually what I did was I used the now wax up to make a new screw retain provisional on the canine as a guide so that I know exactly how to design the final restoration on that peg lateral. And Nicole was very adamant about the fact that she didn't want her teeth touched at all if I could help it. So normally I would do a pretty good bevel um, at least when I'm adding that length onto the central, um, but she doesn't want that. And so it's going to make it a little bit more difficult for me to do the composite. It's also going to make it more difficult because I'd like you to recognize how much hypocalcification Nicole has on her teeth and her teeth completely change colors once I get her isolated. And so I'm going to have to take shade photos with the teeth hydrated before I begin and then I'm going to have to work on the off those photos and trust those photos even though her teeth are going to be continuing to look wider and more blotchy. And the other aspect of this is she doesn't want any hype of calcification built into the composite on the lateral. Now that makes it a lot more difficult for me to match the left lateral. She wants it to blend in but she doesn't want any white spots. And so you have to kind of pick the overall base color of the left lateral and then match it on the right lateral. 
I'm also not going to do any prep on that right lateral incisor whatsoever. I'm simply going to pack her traction cord to get it down out of my way, and then I'm going to air abrade it to clean it. You'll notice before she had some pretty good stain, especially measly, and so I'm just going to air abrade it with aluminum oxide to clean it, and then I'm going to etch it with phosphoric or phosphoric acid, and um, put my dent adhesive and and then build starting with the lingual, um, that being my lingual portion, and essentially I'm building a direct crown on her lateral incisor. Um, then I'll go to the central, then I'll go to the canine on her left side, um, and then prep her uh, mandibulars for the veneers and get my final impression for the implant. <clears throat> Here's our contour following our initial bonding. Um, I like to get a PA so I can see subgingivally that everything is nice. I don't have any overhangs. I have it cleaned up nicely. I haven't blocked out um, our papilla in any way. So once I get everything ready to go, I'll make a custom screw retained impression coping. This is how I'm going to get that soft tissue profile um, from Nicole's mouth onto the lab bench. Um, that can be very difficult if you don't make something that screws on and preserves that contour because the soft tissue profile will collapse if you simply just put in an impression coping. Um, we have a course in Las Vegas, our Implant Direct 102 course, where we actually do this in a hands-on exercise. So if you're unfamiliar with that technique, uh, come hang out with us and we can go through it. Um, here's what it looks like. So a screw retained, um, custom impression coping. And uh, here are Nicole's mandibular preps. So very little facial reduction. Um, it's difficult to tell, but the margins have been dropped subgingially as they move uh, um, from an anterior to a posterior direction. <clears throat> and you'll notice that I barely had to take any enamel off at all on the facial. I simply just put a very, very faint finish line so the ceramist knows where to finish it. But because we finished the case um, in a class one canine relationship and spaced them out, all I have to do is be sure to drop that interproximal margin deep enough so that we can get a nice emergence profile. So you'll notice we have plenty of reduction there for our veneers. These are our veneers when we get them back. Um, they are be, they're sitting on an orchid leaf and being backlit so you can get an idea for how thin they are. They're very thin facially. And then also if you notice these wings, you'll see how they extend interproximally all the way to the lingual aspect of the tooth. Uh, here are veneers bonded in. Um, so our pre, after, and uh, final of our veneer cementation. Um, if you take a look at this PA of the veneers, um, you can see how much enamel we still have interproximally before we bond it on. And so these veneers are essentially um, in 100% in, in enamel. And then our final restoration, as this program is um, named, will be our implant restoration. And so um, we have our soft tissue profile right where we want it. And we need to decide what we're going to make this um, abutment and our final restoration out of. And I like to always pose the question in workshops and say, who chooses the abutment? Um, does the dentist choose the abutment? Does the technician choose the abutment? Um, does the patient have some say so in it? Uh, who chooses the abutment? And I would say, you know, it's probably a collaborative effort between everyone. Um, what I like to say um, to the patient, if if I know they don't care at all, they just want it to look as best, you know, possibly can, I would talk to my technician and say, you know, here's what I'm going for. Um, I, it's a canine. Um, it's going to be under function. Um, here's our tissue thickness. Here's our profile. Uh, what do you think would give us the best result in your hands, you know, you being the ceramist? And if we start looking at different abutments, and we're going to live here, of course, in the um, custom abutment world, we have um, a custom titanium abutment that's been anodized gold on our far left over here. And then if we go to the UCLA type of abutments, and I'm going to walk you through in just a little bit the fabrication process of a UCLA versus a hybrid because I feel that's very confusing for people. And so we can have a complete gold alloy. 
we could have a PFM, we could have a full zirconia, or we could have a two-piece hybrid. And the two-piece hybrid um, is typically a titanium um, cylinder that you can either order out of the catalog or you can have a milling center um, mill one for you. And then you can put either zirconia or Emax over the top of that to sculpt the margin, control your margin placement, control the subgingival contour, um, everything and everything above the sun. So if we look at our cement retained desired options, and um, we're going to stick around over here um, on the custom side, and our aesthetic options are this. We can do um, a metal ceramic UCLA type, we can do a full zirconia, or we can do um, a two-piece hybrid with Emax or zirconia going over our tie base. Now, a couple quick things. Zirconia, what are the advantages, what are the disadvantages? Um, the advantages are they can be very beautiful. Um, even if you have a thin uh, tissue that's thin facially. But we also know that because the zirconia is in fact so strong that the implant itself can get wear within the hex um, at the interface um, due to the zirconia. And if we compare the zirconia to the hybrid, um, we also know that we get a stronger situation from um, an internal connection via that secondary metallic component. So that tie hex, um, we get an overall stronger situation. So if I were to ask all of you and say, what, given Nicole's situation, being a canine, what custom abutment would you choose? This is what we chose. We chose to go with a hybrid um, tie base with zirconia over the top and that's what we have here. And then our final restoration is going to be uh, porcelain stacked to zirconia and I'm going to bond everything in with Panavia um, F I do believe is what I used. Uh, the technique that I like to use when I'm bonding these in is a cord to provide a barrier, a physical barrier between the margin of the abutment and the soft tissue. Remember, we don't have many epithelial connective tissue attachment growing into the abutment. And if we just load up our restoration with cement and seed it, that cement can go all the way down uh, to the implant platform. And then I like to fill the chimney of the abutment with um, sterilized uh, PTFE. And I like to make sure that once the PTFE is in, that there's still some space in the chimney. So any excess cement will hopefully go there, making the cleanup easier um, all the way around. So here is Nicole at the end of our initial bonding and our first abutment placement. And the reason I say first is you'll notice that we, in fact, have a problem. I have a problem. And that problem is right there. And that is the grain of her soft tissue. And when she came back in, I looked at it and I talked to her about it. And she said, it seems gray. And I said, it seems really gray to me. And if I go back to our abutment here and I show it to you, you're going to notice that it has a pretty decent collar of titanium right here. And so notice how it sits on the platform of the implant. There's that little strip. And I think that little strip is what's negatively influencing our tissue color. So let's go to the literature and let's look at what's been published via color changes of soft tissue based on the abutment material. And uh, this is, um, the Journal of Perio and Restorative Dentistry, 2007, Young, and he looked at titanium abutments, titanium abutments veneered with ceramic, zirconia abutments, and zirconia veneered with ceramic. And then what he did is he looked at different tissue thicknesses. So what they did is they 
bury these in pig jaws and they controlled the amount of tissue that went over the top. So at 1.5, 2, and 3 millimeters of soft tissue thickness. And then what they did is they evaluated them with a photospectrometer. And here's what they used. So the custom titanium, titanium with zirconia over it, full zirconia, and then zirconia layered with ceramic. And here's what they found. All materials induced color change that diminished as the tissue increased thickness. So everything changed the color of the soft tissue. At two millimeters of soft tissue thickness, zirconia alone induced the minimal amount of color change. And to the human eye, none of the materials induced soft tissue color changes if the tissue was three millimeters or thicker. Now you would think that's great, but when you really start looking and you really start measuring how thick that tissue is, on the facial aspect of your implants, and you say, as long as I have three I can, millimeters, I can choose whatever I want, and you start really looking, you'll realize that you very rarely ever have three millimeters. And so here was a, a chart that they published, and that line right where that blue arrow is, um, is 3.7, which represents the critical threshold for the color to change enough that it could be tech, detected with um, the naked eye. And so, these lines, these, this purple, red, and green represent the tissue thickness, and then we have down here on the bottom the titanium custom abutment, the titanium with ceramic over it, full zirconia, and then zirconia with ceramic over it. And then if it crosses that line, you know that this first column, titanium, is only safe if the tissue's three millimeters or more. Titanium layered with ceramic is only safe if you have three millimeters or more. Zirconia still induces color change if it's only 1.5 millimeters thick on the tissue. And so really two millimeters, you're good with the zirconia. And three millimeters, of course, you're good with everything. And then zirconia layered with ceramic, you're good until even with the 1.5, you're going to see some visible color change with the naked eye. So let's look at Nicole. So here's Nicole's model work. There's our soft tissue profile. And remember what her bone looked like before the implant was placed. We were trying to get in a 10 millimeter implant, but we really couldn't bury it, so to speak. Now, what I typically aim for is for that platform of that implant to be three to four millimeters below that facial gingival margin. Now if you look, we're about 1.5 to 2 millimeters below, probably closer to 1.5. And so the implant itself is not very deep. The deeper you get the implant, the thicker that tissue is. And if you look closely, it's almost as if through this gingival melange material, you can almost see that probe, but not quite. And then if I measure the tissue thickness with some calipers, I get 1.1 millimeters. It's not very thick at all. So what am I going to do? I'm going to drill down to the screw, pull out the Teflon tape that I put in, the PTFE, unscrew it, and put in a full zirconia abutment. So here's our second abutment and our second restoration on that right canine implant. <clears throat> the crown is made of the same material as previous. It's uh, zirconia with layered ceramic over the top. Here's our abutment in place, and here is our second go at the restoration. And now you can see it looks much better. Here's our right side, left side. If you compare the right side to her left side, um, it's blending in pretty nicely. And there's Nicole. There's where Nicole started. I switched cameras, by the way. That's why this is actually true color on her right side versus a uh, flash I was using when I originally started the case. So there is her final right side. And what I would like to talk to you real quick before we wrap it up is the fabrication of these abutments. Um, the UCLA abutment differs from the hybrid in the fact that underneath this plastic sleeve that you would wax to is an undercut and then a hex, like a mushroom hex. So the undercut locks the material on all the way around and then this above this kind of um, 
hex here that will then sit above the platform of whatever you're going to wax on and cast will prevent the anti-rotation. And so between this titanium, or actually it's typically gold, between this precious alloy and whatever material you make your abutment out of, you're going to get a cold cure weld between the two using the the hex that originally came with this abutment. So this will be your final hex. I'm going to walk you through the steps of it in just a minute. So here's the steps in the UCLA abutment fabrication. You'll start with your plastic sleeve and wax on your contour. You will then sprue that and then invest it. Put the investment in a pressurized chamber to get out all the bubbles. You'll then melt out the wax and then drop in uh, your precious metal and cast it. Here's the button. You'll break that out, clean it up with some air abrasion, and there is our final UCLA abutment with the original hex on the button that will then get cut off and cleaned out. And now we have the start of what then will be layered with opaque, and then you essentially make it exactly like you would a PFM restoration. So notice that all the way through to this point on the UCLA abutment, we have not used any cement or bonding agent. There's no been no looting agent used to get that abutment fabricated. And this is our original hex that we started with over here. Now, let's look at the hybrid and talk about how they differ. The hybrid is going to start with either a part that you bought out of a catalog or something that was milled out of um, titanium. In this case, we had a milling um, factory here in Las Vegas mill this initial abutment, and then we had them. Um, now, it depended on what you're going with. Remember, you can go with Emacs or um, zirconia over the top. If we were doing Emacs, we would wax it, just like I'm showing you here in this photo, and then press it, but what we're going to do in this particular fabrication is we're going to uh, also have this original abutment here scanned, and then zirconia milled, which will then be bonded to, <clears throat> it'll be two pieces that will then be bonded together, and then the last step of it is if we can, we want to modify this. So look at how this collar here of titanium is so much thinner than the original one that we had with Nicole. And then you're going to notice what we're going to do is we're going to change it from a raw metal color to gold. And we're going to do that by anodizing uh, the titanium. So real quick, I want to walk you through that. Um, anodizing is just simply adding a surface coating um, to the titanium, and what you do is you change the voltage um, to get whatever color it is you're desiring, and what you do is you attach volts to the abutment, and then you submerge a lead sheet um, in your solution, which uh, we would use distilled water and a salt substance um, to do the anodization. I'm going to show you a video of that in just a second. And that's how, you know, everything that comes out of the package and they, it's been color coordinated, um, they've been anodized. And so here's a quick video. This is um, the initial stages of a hybrid. And very quickly, we will dunk it in. And in a matter of just a few moments, we will change it from a metal color to a gold color, which will hopefully then give the soft tissue a nice hue. And that's how we would take um, raw titanium and uh, change the color. And so um, here's just a central incisor implant. Um, this is a patient who also has very thin tissue. And we have a UCLA on the, on, over here on the left side of your screen. We have a two-piece hybrid here, and we have a full zirconia. And what I'd like you to notice is how those influence the soft tissue. So you'll see definitely some color coming through and some darkness. This one, not so much. And this one, probably the least of all. 
So remember, at two millimeters or thinner of tissue, your best result from an aesthetic standpoint of the soft tissue is going to be um, with your full zirconia abutment or keeping this collar absolutely minimal as possible on your two-piece hybrid. And very quickly, I wanted to mention um, some new things that are on the horizon. Um, I have, wasn't able to show you any cases just because this is waiting for FDA approval here in the States. It's been very successfully used in Canada and Australia, but it is a two-toned anodized abutment. So um, the SB abutment or smart base abutment, it has a subgingival um, purple contour to give the soft tissue a very thin collar a gold anodized not to negatively affect um, whatever you're going over the top of it with whether it be zirconia or emacs and then the coolest thing about the smart base is you'll notice that it has this channel that you can lean your wrench to tighten down the screw up to 25 degrees and so in situations where you want to use a screw retained anterior restoration but typically you always had to have that channel coming out in the long axis of the implant that was placed you can get off 25 degrees and still be able to torque this screw and so um, that's coming down the line um, I can't wait to show you some of those and uh, here's our patient here's Nicole all said and done Really quickly before we uh, go to the questions, and I can answer some questions for you guys, um, I want to talk to you about the 102 course that I offer here in Vegas. If you haven't come, I'd love to have you. It's uh, two days of lecture and hands-on. And um, in every one of my courses, I try to speak on some behavioral aspect of dentistry. And in the 102, it's a concept called flow. And it's about getting to your point in life in dentistry where dentistry offers energy in return. So instead of going to your office day in and day out and being exhausted, how do you get to a position that you absolutely love what you do, you love going to your office, you love the people you treat, you're compensated, um, and everyone is very appreciative of what you do, and um, and living in that area, no matter what it is you're passionate about, is, is a concept called flow. And the other, uh, we talk about lots of things in the 102 course, but it's two days on anterior implant dentistry. So um, modifying contour, sculpting soft tissue, screw retained provisionals, screw retained um, custom impression copings, abutment selection. Um, it builds on everything that we went over today. So day of surgery, two weeks, four weeks, four months, um, using compression down here, and the, and the contour of your provisional to sculpt the soft tissue, getting things to where you want. How do you handle these situations um, in immediates? Do you flap? Do you do a bone graft? Do you do a provisional? Um, do you do a delayed approach? Do you do an immediate approach? Um, how do you handle it? What's the overall best situation? What does the literature say? Um, there's our custom impression coping, our final abutment, and our single unit central before and after, bone grafting around these, and that's our 102 course. Our 103 course is multiple adjacent anterior and posterior implants, full arch implant supported prosthetics, different prosthetic options, and also finance and fear. So we talk about flow in the 102, um, we get into finance and money in your life, how your beliefs shape how money will come and go in your life, all things that uh, behavioral aspects that I like to work into the discussion um, about finding your flow in dentistry and then how fear um, affects the decisions you make in your life. And then also the last course I want to mention to you is our photography course. I do a two-day course <coughs> excuse me, here in Vegas, actually all over where we look at treatment planning, complex cases, shooting our photos, what do we use our photos for, how do we use our photos to give um, an amazing new patient experience. And I'd like you to think to yourself for a second, if you bring new patients into your office and you carry this fear that if you're too good, so if you are too competent and too comprehensive, that you're going to scare patients off, you are playing a guessing game with yourself. You are saying to yourself, I need to be just as good as I need to be to get them to say yes. But the problem is you don't know 
how good they want you to be. And so it can really induce a lot of anxiety in you as far as how do I bring new patients in? Um, what do I say? What do I do? Um, how far do I take it? Um, and so we really go into that and this process of case acceptance and how do you present treatments to patients. And so, yes, you need to know how to get the photos, but once you know how to take your photos, what do you do with them? And so what I do with them is I help use the photos to help the patient be aware of the problem. So I may say something along the lines of here's you, here's normal, and here's where I think you're going by bringing in a photo of another patient to help them understand that they are that there is in fact a problem. And then what I do is I make sure that they know the consequences if they choose to do nothing today. So what their future life will look like if they don't do the dentistry that I'm recommending today. What dentistry will they most likely need in the future? And then I simply show them patients just like themselves once I've treated them. And here's options that exist. And then I say, do you have any desire in that? And then taking photos for marketing, for decorating your office, for Instagram, all that fun stuff. And really getting patients who come in asking for something like this patient here whose name is April. April comes in wanting veneers. And um, April ends up getting crown lengthening, orthodontics, orthodontic jaw surgery and you know 12 porcelain veneers you know how do you get patients to say yes to that um, in a way that they feel very comfortable and you're not putting any pressure on them so that's uh, what our photography course is about if you're coming to Vegas uh, for the AID in October um, I'm doing a, a four-hour course from 8 a.m. to noon on Friday October 25th if you can swing by i um, love to spend four hours with you it would be building um, on everything that we discussed today Thank you so much for uh, joining me, and um, I'm going to pull up my screen here and open it up to questions. Why not anodize pink? Good question, Mark. Um, you absolutely can. Um, different colors anodize better, and depending on the machine that your lab has, um, I guess where the big question becomes is what about when you make titanium bars on full um, implant arch prosthetics like in hybrids so that when you're going to make a titanium bar and wrap it with acrylic so it doesn't negatively impact the color of acrylic, you can. We haven't had good luck in my lab anodizing pink. We have much better with gold for whatever reason. And I'm not sure if it's the machine we're using, um, but most labs for whatever reason are anodizing um, gold. Uh, you'll notice on that smart base above it that they, it's coming pre-anodized pink um, to give a nice hue to the tissue. So I think it's more about the equipment the lab has. Uh, second question, um, can you talk again about the provisional over implant versus a flipper type? Wasn't aware of any provisional that would work. Thanks. So the question is, can you talk about the provisional over the implant? Now I'm, I'm guessing you're talking about uh, Nicole's case here, um, and I'm not sure specifically what you're asking. So I guess maybe are you asking about the advantages over a screw retained provisional over a flipper? There's lots. So the advantage is if when a patient has a flipper, if they're not wearing it all the time, the soft tissue uh, will in fact collapse. So that's one thing they can take it out. Um, the other thing is if you can get something on the implant, the day the implant goes in, you're going to preserve that gingival um, embrasure, which will support the soft tissue. And typically it's always easier to preserve what the patient has there than to come back later and try to recreate it. Kind of that preservation versus, you know, rebuilding later. I think that's what you're asking. When you were preparing the rest, this, uh, third question, when you were preparing the restoration on the lateral, you no longer had your temporary on the implant. Do you worry about the tissue collapsing? No, because it's only going to be off for a little while. So no, I wouldn't. Um, it probably took me an hour, hour and a half to bond the lateral. And um, no, I didn't worry about it at all. And it actually, it allowed me to kind of come in and really polish and finish that interproximal on the distal of the lateral, um, which makes it so much easier than, you know, say the mesial. So no, it was only off for a short time, and so I wasn't too concerned about it. All right, thank you everyone. I really appreciate everyone's time this evening. Um, my email is at the bottom down there, jblvdds at gmail. 
Um, if you think of any questions, uh, let everything digest. You can always email me. Um, I'd be happy to answer any of those, and um, I look forward to seeing all of you in a future course.